All right, let's jump into the second video. In the first video, we talked about what everything was. In this video, we're gonna talk about what everything does. So, this camera is mechanical-ish, okay? What that means is that the battery, the, the camera's shutter speeds from 1 60th, I believe it is, or maybe it's from the flash sync speed up to 1 2000th are mechanical and do not require a battery to use, but the slow shutter speeds do require a battery to use and the light meter and automatic mode also require a battery. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to change the battery in the camera. Okay, so here's the battery chamber. A standard a US nickel or many other coins will unscrew the battery cap just like that. It doesn't take much to take it off. It's like one and a quarter turns. And then you can see the batteries inside of there. Now before we get any further, here is the battery cap, and you can see that it has a plus sign uh, on it. That's an indicator that the positive terminal of the battery is supposed to touch the battery cap. What you're seeing right there is the positive terminal. The side with the text on it is the positive terminal. So when you load the batteries, make sure that the text side of the battery is facing the bottom of the camera like you see it right now. So to change the batteries, you've got two 357 type batteries in there. You just dump them out into your hand. 357 are also called AG AG13, LR44, A76, S76, all the same thing, and they will all work. So you need two of those. And to load them, all you have to do is hold the camera upside down, drop one in, make sure that it's positive terminal up, drop the second one in, make sure that it's positive terminal up, take the battery cap and screw it on. The battery cap should thread easily and without any resistance. If it's fighting, just back it out and try again. You don't want to cross thread these. Replacement battery caps aren't cheap. So a note on batteries. Uh, honestly, if you have a Pentax LX, you're probably just going to put really good batteries in it, but let me hammer that home. I almost exclusively use Duracell batteries, but Energizer and any of the other name brand batteries are just fine to use. Don't use the unknown brand fly-by-night batteries that are for sale on everybody's favorite online mega retailer because uh, I have had a nice and long history of those leaking or blowing up in cameras. It's happened more than I like to admit. Sometimes they also just die after two or three days. Uh, those are not good batteries. And yes, they're like the price of two Duracells, you could get about a hundred of those cheap batteries. But if they break or leak in your camera, the cost of that repair is going to be more than many decades worth of good batteries would be. So just skip the repair, buy good batteries, and just make sure that you keep an eye on them to change them out about once a year and you'll be fine. So um, yeah, don't buy cheap batteries. All right, now that we've changed out the batteries, let's talk about how to change the lens on the camera. Replacing the lens is really easy to do. Just push down on the lens release button here and turn it counter or anti-clockwise about a quarter of a turn and remove the lens. Red lens mounting index dot here, red lens mount index dot there. Just line those two up, turn it about a quarter turn until it clicks into place. I'll let you hear that again. Once it clicks into place, then your lens is locked. I'm gonna show you a trick with Pentax lenses. You can change lenses without even looking at the camera. If you'll notice, the lens release button is lined up with this little white dot right here. So if you hold the lens like this, and you have your finger on the, or thumb rather, on the white dot, and you feel for the lens release button, they line up and then you can turn it and you don't have to take your eye off of the scene and you can track whatever action is going on in front of you and know exactly where to point the lens when you recompose your image with your new lens mounted on the camera. Okay, so now that we've got a battery in the camera and a lens mounted, let's load film in the camera so that we can take some actual photos. We're gonna lift up the film rewind button and we're going to put the film cassette into the camera. 
Next, we're gonna pull out a leader and feed it into the film take-up spool, just like that. And now we're going to advance the film. And if we put our thumb over the sprocket uh, connection right here, we should, there we go, keep these engaged long enough that the film gets taken up easily so that uh, it, uh, it doesn't fall off of the take-up spool and not advance. Okay, so now we're gonna close the film back. Would help if I wasn't in automatic mode with the lens cap on. And now notice the film, the film uh, rewind knob here. I'm gonna make sure that there's no slack in it. And as I advance the film, the rewind knob is going to turn. Okay, and there we have it. The film, uh, if the film rewind knob is turning, we know the film is being taken up. Now you can stop at either zero or one with this camera. This camera, uh, I have stopped at zero before and started counting from zero, so I know I've taken zero photos, and it does not cut off any part of that first frame. Matter of personal preference, whether you want to start at how many photos you've taken or which frame this is about to be. Okay. Now. For those of you who have never used film before, you're going to go through your day taking your photos. And the important thing, well, there's many important things to know about film, but for this part of the video, the important thing to know is that film is one and done. It can record light a single time in a controlled manner through a proper shutter speed and aperture, or in an uncontrolled manner like this. If you open up the film back with your film in your camera, you will erase the images that are on your film. But I want to show you how this works. As you advance the film, you take a photo, and then the, the photo's been taken, and you advance the film, and the film is pulled out of the cassette over here and onto the take-up spool. And you can see again the film rewind knob moving, and the reason for that is because this is a mechanical connection from the take-up spool to the film rewind knob, okay? Just like that. When you're done with your roll of film, you push the film release button down and you hold it. Yep, you hold it. If you let go, it's not gonna work. And then you're going to rewind the film. Now, before we get too far. Before we go on to the next step, I'm going to show you exactly how the film moves through the camera. I think this is a really good way to do it. And you can see here how much the smiley face moves from in front of the shutter to past the shutter. And this is where the photo we just took was. This is where the photo that we're about to take is. Okay. So you've gone through your whole day, you've taken all of your photos, and you've rewound your film the whole way. At this point now, you can open up your film back. Your film is inside of the film cassette. We'll drop it into our hand. And now you can grab another film cassette and load it in and keep going. Or if you're finished for the day, close the film back and make sure your, your shutter has been fired and you are done with your film. Next thing we're gonna talk about is flash use with this camera. Now, not all of the prisms have a flash. The FA1W and, uh, FA1 and FA1W have flash hot shoes. Uh, other flash, other prisms like the FA2 and uh, the, the Sport Finder over there do not have hot shoes. So you can mount with this, with this prism a flash on top of the camera just like this. You also have over here PC ports. Those are Prontor Comper ports um, that connect to an FP style flash on the top or an X style flash on the bottom. The hot shoe is also X and this flash right here is an X. If you don't have to change the bulbs after every shot, it's an X flash. Okay, so, the, uh, so you can either plug the, the flash into the hot shoe or into the PC port down here. The worst possible place for a flash is right on top of your camera. And the reason is because the light leaves the flash, reaches your subject, bounces back to your lens, and because all of the light is moving like this, your subject looks flat and waxy. When you think about how we see people outside under the sun or under overhead lights at night, indoors with overhead lighting, 
people and other things we see are always lit from above, and that's what we think of as being natural, okay? So you want to use your flash to replicate that. So if you have to put your flash in the hot shoe, try to get one that at least has a tilting head so that you can bounce the light off of the ceiling. Even better is one that has a tilting and articulating head so that you can turn the flash and have it bounce up off of a wall if you don't have a ceiling, or off of a wall and a ceiling for even more bounce. The more dispersion of light that you get with your flash, the softer the light and the more flattering it's going to be to your subject. If you don't have a viewfinder with a hot shoe, you can still use a flash on this camera by plugging it into one of the PC ports right here. So if you have a standard flash, you would plug it into the bottom port, and then you could put the flash off to the side of the camera like this. Now, if you have an inexpensive flash that's locked with the flash pointing forward, and you got something called a flash bar, which is this guy right here, you get one screw to thread into the tripod socket on your camera, and then this other screw threads into an adapter for your flash, and then the cable goes to the, the PC port. And now you can rotate your flash. So you can hold your camera in portrait orientation and bounce your flash off the ceiling. You can hold it in landscape orientation and bounce your flash off the wall, or at some angle like that. And that gives you a lot of flexibility for less money than a very high-end flash. Now the flash sync on this camera is a bit weird because there are two different flash sync speeds. In manual mode, the flash sync is X and anything slower than X. In automatic mode, when a flash is connected, which it knows because the flash is either talking to the camera through these two contacts on the hot shoe or these two contacts on the front of the camera. In automatic mode, the flash sync speed is 1 30th of a second and slower. Now, the reason for that in automatic mode has to do with timing. I don't fully understand. I really honestly do not understand why it's different in automatic versus manual mode. It may have to do with some sort of delay in the metering. That's conjecture. I couldn't find anything that explained from a technical perspective why the flash sinks were different. But let's stick with manual mode. I tend to recommend using flashes in manual mode versus automatic mode because it is a little bit easier to control your camera in manual mode for flash use versus automatic mode. Okay, so X is 1 75th of a second. The reason that a flash the flash sync is 1 75th of a second is that you have two curtains, okay? And when you hit the shutter button, the first curtain opens, and then at 1 75th of a second, all of the film is exposed to light for, uh, let's call it a 75th of a second. It's close enough. And then the, the second curtain closes. So at that speed, you could the camera can trigger a flash, and the entire film plane is, is exposed to the light from the flash before you advance the, and then when you advance the film, the curtains reset, okay? Let's say you're taking a four second exposure. The first curtain opens, the entire film is open to light for, between friends, four seconds. And then the second curtain closes and then you advance the film. So a flash will work there. But what if you're at one two thousandth of a second? Well, the first curtain opens and then the second curtain comes in right behind it. So the entire film plane is never open to light at the exact same moment with anything faster than 1 75th of a second. There's always some amount of gap, depending on the shutter speed, between the curtains. So if you fired an X flash at those shutter speeds, then what would happen is you would just have an illuminated strip of light that tells you how, um, how far apart your curtains are and doesn't give you a fully exposed image. Now with FP bulbs, you do have a faster sync speed, I believe up to one two thousandth of a second with those, but um, those aren't in wide use anymore. And this, flash, this camera is not compatible with high speed sync flashes. So the next thing we're gonna do is replace the prism on this camera. To, this, this might or might not work one-handed, we'll see. To, replay, to, to unlock the prism, as you can see it's locked in here right now, we're gonna push down on this button and turn this switch toward the prism 
And now we can slide the prism off the camera just like that. Here's the prism that we had on there. Thankfully, no, no fingerprints on the glass. That's always a huge relief. Now we can, if we don't want to use this, we can either, you can release, remove the prism for a number of reasons. Maybe you've got, like I just did on there, a dust spot and you want to clean it off. Very good reason to remove the screen. Or you want to put a different screen on for a different purpose. Maybe you're, you've done, you're finished shooting your sports with the sports finder and you're going to go shoot some street work so you want to have the uh, waist level viewfinder. You can just put on a different prism. And then to put the new prism on, you just slide it into the channels here. It's just got little rails and slide it forward until it locks into place. And if you can't pull it off, then it's locked into place and you've changed your prism. Okay, next thing we're going to do here is literally my least favorite thing to do with this camera because every time we do this, there's a chance of damaging the focusing screen and these have gotten insanely expensive lately. Okay, so let's say you have a comparable camera, say the Nikon F2, all right? I've taken my prism off of this already. If we push the button on the back, the release button, we can just take the focusing screen out or drop it into our hands, just like that. It's really easy to do. And this allows us to clean the focusing screen quite easily, and it's very safe to do that and to change the focusing screen. And then to, drop, to, to replace it, we just drop it back into place and if I do it correctly, it actually goes in the right way. There we go. And then we can just clean around it. That's so dusty because I haven't used this camera in five months. And then we just take the prism. <laughs> this prism is so bent. Uh, there it goes. It click back, clicks back into place, and then we can click it back into place like that. The F2, great design, super easy. Or, or maybe we have a Canon F1 over here. And, and we just push the button to unlock the prism on, the, on it, take the prism off, and then, hey, look at that. We can, we can access the, the, the focusing screen. Some, oh yeah, that's right. Doesn't have a release. We just have to pry it up just like that. And we can get to the focusing screen and clean it or swap out the whole stack to put in a different focusing screen. Really love the focusing screen swapping on the Canon F1. I think it does, I think the Canon F1 does that better than any other camera ever made. Because the Pentax LX is weather sealed, at least this is the conjecture I found online, the, pres the focusing screen is replaced a different way. You don't replace the entire stack, you just replace the focusing screen. And in order to do that, we have to get into it through the shutter box. And this is kind of a pain because in order to do, to do this correctly, the camera has to be upright. So, um, Otherwise, the prism, the focusing screen will not nest correctly. Now, what you need when you do this is a focusing screen replacement kit like this. I really don't recommend doing this without one, the proper tools. Okay, so just gonna grab this guy and pull it out. These are the pliers that come with the focusing screen replacing kit. Here's a screen that we could put in. We're going to grab it. We're going to set it upright in that holder right there. All of the grabbing that we do with this focusing screens is done with this tip right here on the tab of the screen. It never touch the actual screen itself. You will scratch it and leave a mark on your screen. I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. Next, underneath here, there is a little tab that we need to hook with the hooky part of this of this tool in order to open. There it goes. Okay, it's uh, it is right in the middle, by the way. And then, when you tilt when the camera's upright, gravity pulls the focusing screen down. And now, what we're going to do is we're going to reach into the focusing into the camera's shutter area. We're going to grab the tab with our tool, take out our focusing screen, and put it over here to be safely stored and so we can put the other screen in. Now I promised you I was going to show you what this looks like. Let's see if we can get it lit up here well enough. There we go. That's how we're going to do it. All right, you should be able to see by the where I'm grabbing the screen with the uh, plier tool, there are a couple of little scratches right there. 
those are actually in the focusing mat and happened the first time that I installed this screen, which was new old stock when I got it. Cannot express how frustrated I was by that. At any rate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the screen that we just took out, set it right there. Now we can kind of clean the underside of the focusing screen stack and put this one back in, or let's say that we had the plain mat screen in there and we want to switch to the split screen like this or the grid screen like the other one has or one of the other 14 screens that were available for this we grab that screen again by the tab and what we're going to do is we're going to slide it into the metal cradle inside of the camera now this is the part that has to be done with the camera resting upright if the camera is not resting upright then the cradle will not seat properly so we're just going to, what, what we're going to do, I'm going to see if I can show you how to do this without closing it. If you look in this, oh, mother of pearl. All right, so if we look at the cradle, in the center of the cradle, there's a little tab that pokes out. And, on, and as you're looking at it this way, to the right of that tab is where the, the holding tab for the focusing screen goes. And that is... Um, the only orientation that will, you can put this in, it's the, the, the cradle is shaped that, that way to ensure it. And if you put it in any other way, you're just going to damage your camera. So that's placed properly-ish. Can I just kind of use some, there we go. Now it's placed properly. That's what the, the, the screen should look like when it's placed. The action that we have to do is to take the, uh, this tool and push the cradle shut. This will only work if the camera is resting on its base, so I'm not actually going to be able to show you exactly how that looks. Now, if you don't have the camera resting on its base when you do that, then what can happen is that the uh, cradle will appear to be nested properly, but it won't be. And one or two or three photos in, the cradle's gonna pop open and that can damage your mirror and your cradle and your focusing screen. I've been very lucky the three times it's happened to me and have learned the hard way about that, uh, that nothing was damaged, but it can absolutely happen. So now once you have that nested, what you wanna do is double check that it's nested properly by holding it upright and pushing on that tab again. And you might be able to see in there, that is what it should look like. I know it's kind of hard to see. This is a really, really tough angle to get, but this is what it should look like. And there's nothing wrong once it's seated with giving it another press just to be safe. Okay, I cannot believe, I cannot believe I put another scratch on my focusing screen. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the next thing. Um, there are benefits to different focusing screens, by the way. The grid focusing screen, which I use in my, my other LX over here, is my favorite screen. For any camera that has a grid focusing screen option, uh, they are fantastic. Some screens are better for telephoto lenses, some are better for macro work. Some are better, some should not be used with telephoto lenses, like the split prisms, for instance. Uh, also, split prisms don't work for macro and high magnification work where the viewfinder is inherently dark. So, um, one of the benefits of having interchangeable focusing screens is that you can um, use a different focusing screen for different types of photography. Next thing we're going to do is talk about how to read the light meter on the Pentax LX. Uh, so what I did was I looked through my camera's light meter and I've recreated it uh, uh, in Affinity Design to show you what you're seeing if you have a split prism mat screen. The screen doesn't matter. We're concerned with what's over here on the light meter, okay? So here's what you would see if you look through the, the viewfinder. And we're going to talk about the light meter. Now to make things a little bit easier because I accidentally printed this way too big, I'm going to put the source image for this that I developed in Affinity Design on the screen now. The viewfinder uses an LED-based readout to indicate shutter speed. The red flag at the top indicates that exposure compensation is in use. The blue flag indicates the shutter's the shutter positions, the shutter dial's position. 
The LEDs indicate what the shutter speed will be in automatic mode or should be in manual mode. So if you're in manual mode and you have a green LED lit up over here by 1 500th of a second and your blue flag is at 1 1 25th, then you just need to adjust your shutter speed dial to get up to 1 500th of a second. And th that setting, those LEDs are based on the, the light in the scene, your film speed, and your lens aperture setting. And then they're going to tell you what your shutter speed is and should be. Now the LED colors vary by shutter speed. 1 30th and faster are green. Speeds from 1 15th to 4 seconds are yellow. This provides an easy color reference for when the camera can be handheld. Green means it can, yellow means it shouldn't be. The AX and LTB speeds uh, are red as indicators of those different settings. In manual mode, LTB indicates that the shutter dial is set to bulb. In automatic mode, it indicates an exposure of longer than four seconds to up to, one, 100, uh, up to 125 seconds. With automatic mode, when the viewfinder indicates LTB, there's no way to identify the exact exposure length, just that it's going to be longer than four seconds. Uh, shooting in manual mode can cause incorrect exposures if the meter information isn't followed, just so you know. So that's how you look, follow along with the viewfinder meter information. And I think that's really every single thing on the camera. Oh, except how to take a photo. So let's do that right now. Let's talk about how to take a photo. Orange flag means we're ready to take a photo. Okay, so we're gonna set this in automatic mode first. And we're going to set the aperture. Here we're gonna go with, uh, let's do F2. And you can see that's a pretty fast shutter speed. And then if we go to F16, Uh, there we go, much longer. So in automatic mode, in order to take a photo, all you have to do is dial in the aperture that you want, focus your image on the point that you want to have be focused, verify that you can hand hold the camera if you're hand holding it, compose your scene as you want it to be on your film, and take your photo. And that is how you use automatic mode, very simple. All right, but you wanna use manual mode. No problem. All you have to do is read the light meter as we talked about. The LEDs will indicate that you need to have a 1 2 50th of a second shutter speed. So you just adjust your shutter dial until the blue flag is on 1 2 50th. For example, it, the LEDs will give you a different reading based on your film speed, aperture, and light in your scene. Once your blue flag is aligned with your LED, you just take the photo and advance the film. And that's it, it's really pretty darn easy to take a photo. So what about double exposures? Double exposures are really easy with this camera. It's, so we're gonna talk about the mechanics of the double exposure first, so you know how to do it, and then the science. To take a double exposure, you're gonna arm the shutter, you're going to take your first exposure, you're going to hold the film rewind knob and lever like this. You're going to hold the film rewind button on the bottom of the camera, and then you're going to advance the film advance lever. What that does is hold the film in place, release the gearing so that the gearing will spin freely as, or not spin more appropriately, as the film lever is armed or used, and then this advances, well, advances the film. It doesn't really when you're doing this operation, but it does rearm the shutter so you can take your second photo. Now, what you're gonna do is advance your film, okay? A note on advancing the film. After you do this operation, the gearing does not re-engage instantly. So when you advance your film after your double exposure, it's only going to advance part way. If you take another photo, it's gonna partly overlap your double exposure. So you have to take a dead frame. F22, one two thousandth of a second, lens cap, exposure, advance. Now that moves your double exposure all the way out of the back of the camera so that your next frame doesn't overlap it. So that's the mechanics of how to do a double exposure. Now let's talk about the science behind the double exposure, okay? 
So let's say you take a meter reading. You're in manual mode, and you and it's, the camera tells you one one twenty fifth of a second at oh, f five six is a proper exposure. Film is designed to receive a certain number of photons, and if it receives more than those, the results aren't going to be great. If it receives less, the results aren't going to be great. So to do a double exposure properly, what you want to do is you need to know that 1 1 25th and f5.6 is a proper single exposure. If you take two exposures at that setting on your film, you're going to end up with a negative that is called thick, dark, or dense. There's, those are three words that mean the same thing. Too many photons, too much negative density. If you digitize your film, you're going to have digital noise and low contrast. If you print your film in a dark room, you're going to have long print times and low contrast. So you want to have proper negative density with a double exposure, even though there's going to be two images on it. If you're in manual mode and these are your settings, then you need to adjust your dial or your aperture to cut the amount of light by half. So you probably know if you're using this camera that going from 1 125th to 1 250th is half the amount of light. These are fractional seconds. The higher the number, the less time. Every time you switch a dot or a click the shutter speed uh, setting rather, you are doubling or having the amount of light with the exception of going from 1 1 25th to X and then to 60 in this section. Everything else here is doubling or having the amount of light compared to the number next to it. So in manual mode, you can either go to 1 2 50th of a second from 1 25th or from F5 6 to F8. Each of these marked numbers is a full stop. Okay, with the exception, I think F2 to 1 4 is, is that a full stop? Yeah, that is a full stop. I take that back. So each of these marked numbers is a full stop. Okay, so if you want to keep it at 1 1 25th, you could then go to F8. And this would be good if, let's say, you needed to use a flash, right? You want to keep it at 1 75th, but F5 6 too much light for double exposure. F8, perfect amount of light for double exposure. Okay, so whatever settings you're going to do, you're going to take your first photo, you're going to hold all of the buttons like we talked about, rearm the shutter, and then you're going to take your second photo. And then advance your film, take your dead frame, advance your film, and you're ready to go on shooting. What if I told you there was an easier way to do this? Let's go to automatic mode. Remember the exposure compensation dial over here? One half of the light is exactly the same as going from 1 1 25th to 1 2 50th. First shot, hold all the things, advance. Second shot, double exposure, properly exposed because you've told the camera to give the film half the correct amount of light for each exposure. Now this becomes a really powerful tool if, let's say, one of your exposures has one set of lighting and the other exposure has a different set of lighting, the camera will automatically figure out the proper exposure and give you half the amount of light. Now once you've finished your double exposure, just be sure to go back to proper exposure, otherwise the rest of your film will be very dark because all of the film will have gotten half the amount of light that it's supposed to have gotten. And that is how you take a double exposure with the Pentax LX, and with that, we have literally covered everything about this camera that you need to know to get out there and get shooting with it. These are absolutely, staggeringly wonderful cameras to use. They remain every year. Since, since I got my first LX, these have been in my top five favorite cameras. They are probably my third favorite camera. Um, they are up there with the Nikon F3, the Minolta Alpha 9, the Olympus OM4, the Canon Original F1 and the Pentax LX. That has been my list of five, my five favorite cameras for many, many years. And these really do earn that spot and they are absolutely fantastic. So thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next Camera Manuals videos.